Let's turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, and verse 13. In our previous studies, we had been considering the nine Beatitudes mentioned in verses 3 to 12. And we could call them nine right attitudes that a Christian should have. We could, in those verses, contrast the spirit of Christ described in those verses with the spirit of Satan, which would be the opposite of those verses. It was Jesus who was poor in spirit and who mourned for sinful Jerusalem, who was gentle, who hungered and thirsted for righteousness in the flesh that he had come in a sinful world, who was merciful, pure in heart, a peacemaker, and who had been persecuted for righteousness' sake and because he represented his father accurately. And the opposite of those right attitudes or characteristics or virtues is the spirit of Satan found in the race of Adam, self-sufficiency, a jovial, casual, careless attitude to life, a harshness and possessive covetousness, thirsting for earthly things and not for righteousness, an unmerciful attitude, impurity of heart, a quarrelsome nature, and seeking the honor of this world even if it means compromise and even if it means not confessing Christ. Those are the opposites. And uh, these verses are good for us to have a spiritual checkup with always. But we know whether we are on the right track, whether we are progressing in these virtues with Jesus considered preeminent. Now we look at verse 13 where Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. And if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? In the context in which it comes, it's clear that it's these virtues that Jesus has just been speaking about in the previous ten verses that give taste to the salt. Without these qualities, the salt would be tasteless. And then, it is good for nothing. Think of that phrase that is used commonly in the world. Good for nothing. It's quite an insult to turn around to a person and to say to him that you are a good for nothing person. And yet those are the very words that Jesus used concerning Christians who did not have these virtues that he had just spoken of. The important thing about salt is not quantity. In a large plateful of rice or curry, we put very little salt. It's not the quantity of salt that is important but the quality. If the salt has lost its taste, even a large amount of such salt would be useless. It would serve no purpose. It is quality, strength, that is important in salt. And Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Which teaches us that the important thing is not for Christians to be large in number on the earth, but like salt, though small in number, small in quantity, yet powerful in quality. This is an emphasis that we need to recapture in our day when Christians are thinking that we can influence the world by numbers or influence a country by increasing in numbers. That is not God's way. That's the way of the world. The world impresses people by numbers. A political party impresses its opponents by numbers. Religious cults, many religions seek to impress people with numbers. Whereas Jesus said very few will find the way to life. He said that later on in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. But here also... He places that emphasis on quality. Salt 
is used. It was used in the days of Jesus for wrapping meat to prevent it from decaying. It's used for res- as a symbol for restraining evil. And that's one of the functions of the Christian on the earth. To restrain evil by our life and by our witness. We can't drive out evil from this world. Jesus will come again in glory and do that one day. But we are to restrain it by our life and by our witness. Think for example, in a room full of people who have no conscience, cracking dirty jokes. When a Christian walks in who has a clear, bright testimony, immediately there is a restraint. But if that Christian has lost his taste as salt, there is no restraint. They continue with their dirty conversation. Such must be our witness in our place of work, with unconverted relatives, in our home, wherever we go, that our influence has a restraining effect on sin and evil. That's how it was with Jesus. When Jesus entered Zacchaeus' house, immediately Zacchaeus was convicted. Jesus didn't open his mouth. He immediately was convicted of his sin. There have been men like that, so filled with the Spirit, whose very presence, without their opening their mouth, convicted people of sin. But when we lose our salt, even if we are large in numbers, it is good for nothing. That's important for all Christians to recognize that a Christian who does not have the virtues listed in these verses has become good for nothing even if he is a member of a church that believes the right doctrine and is born again. It's good for nothing. It's only fit to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. It's possible to have the gifts of the Spirit and still be good for nothing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul makes that clear saying that even if I have the gift of speaking in tongues, even if I have the gift of prophecy and the gift of faith, the ability to move mountains, even if I have charity such that I give my possessions to feed the poor, charity in the sense of giving money, and even if I give my body to be burned, if I don't have love in my heart, I have lost my taste and I am nothing, he says in verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 13. It profits me nothing, he says in verse 3. Notice there, nothing, nothing, zero. We become valueless when the taste has gone out of the salt. Jesus went on to say in verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and put it under the peck measure, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The light speaks of our life. In John 1, 4 it says, In Jesus was life, and that life was the light of men. The only thing that can be called light in this dark world is the life of Jesus. That life, when it comes into me and possesses me and controls me and determines the way I conduct myself, then I too become the light of the world. For Jesus said in John 8, 12 that he was the light of the world. Now he turns around and tells his disciples, you are the light of the world. And men do not light a lamp and put it under a peck measure. A peck measure speaks of business. It speaks of hiding one's testimony in one's place of work. No, in the place of work it must not be hidden under the peck measure. But it must be put on the lampstand for all who are in the house to see. Again, notice that the important thing about light is not its size. Think of an electric bulb, how small it is. And what a large room it can light up. The volume of that electric bulb is so small compared to the volume of that room. 
yet it lights up the whole room and drives out the darkness. It is not size, but quality. You can have a zero watt bulb which doesn't light up the room at all, or a hundred watt bulb which lights up the room brightly. It's not size, it's a question of strength, of light. Let your light then shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. Our good works which come forth from this life of Jesus is the light that people should see. And when they see it, they are to glorify not us for the good works we have done, but our Father in heaven. In other words, we are to do our good works, not just do good works, but do our good works in such a way that we give the glory to God and give God the credit for it. Then, together, many such lights can be the true church of God, described in verse 14 as a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden, not the size of the city, but the power of the light that shines forth from that into a dark world.